I have been waiting for someone to tackle this project for about three decades. I think I have this right, Stugatz, because there was something that could not be verified by anybody, a rumor surrounding Cal Ripken Jr. and how one of the longest streaks in the history of man of any kind, most memorable streaks we've ever seen. I was getting ready to tackle it and someone beat me to the punch. Yes. I was so close. Uh, I've been you, talking you, about it, thinking about tackling this subject for a while. But now. finally, yeah. someone yeah. has done the work to get to the bottom of what is called the rumor. It's a blue wire podcast. The host and producer of it, Sam Dingman is with us now. And I don't know where to start with this because I have a lot of questions. But the, the first place I'll start, thank you for joining us. How did you get this made? Because this is something that people have talked about for a long time, but nobody would dare approach it. Yeah, well, it sounds like I uh, stole Stugatz's project, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much for having us. Um, it's, a, it's a real honor to be talking to you guys. Um, and honestly, the, the way we got it made is my co-host and, and co-producer, Mac Montandon, um, it's exactly the way we say it in the podcast. He goes to a birth. He's, we've both been Orioles fans for all three of those decades. Uh, and then some that the rumor has been whispered about, um, one night Mac goes to a birthday party, hears from a guy in typical rumor fashion, who knows a guy who was on the Baltimore police force the night this all went down. Uh, and he says, it's all totally true. So we do some preliminary checking. Uh, we get a couple of other reliable folks who agree with that sentiment, um, we realize that it's an opportunity to talk not just about whether or not this old flotsam from the pre-internet era may actually have legs, but also about what it means to reconsider your heroes decades on when the circumstances that you fell in love with them under have changed significantly. Uh, and uh, we were very fortunate to connect with the folks at Blue Wire who um, put us in touch with John Yales and Peter Moses, uh, who have been our story Sherpas the whole way through. And here we are. For the uninitiated, okay, this is the rumor. The rumor is, and I don't know how you can tackle this part of it legally, but the rumor is, Stugatz, what are the details that you have heard of this rumor? What do you know? What is the past uh, as it regards the Cal Ripken streak that you know? What, about the streak itself? That there um, was about the rumor that kept the streak alive. Do you know what the rumor I is? I have no idea what the rumor is. Again, I said I was about to tackle this project. I never got to okay. tackling the project. That's why we're <laughs> having Sam on, so okay. Sam can tell us what okay. the rumor you was. You are unbelievable. You like that? So you don't even <laughs> so guys, know the got rumor. got myself out you, of it. No, you didn't. You failed. Well, even, I know even the even rumor is protecting himself from legal repercussions. Costner, <laughs> Ripken, a wife is involved, a cheating scandal, two friends, the extension of the streak. Right. He called it up on the internet. Okay. okay. Okay, so Sam, you are useless. I mean, just <laughs> fundamentally useless. I was about to tackle. I never the, got to it. The the rumor, <laughs> the the rumor is, uh, and I don't know if you guys got to verification. I don't know how many episodes there are, but that the streak was kept alive. How, Sam? Yes. So here is here is the rumor as it is commonly told. Uh, it's August fourteenth, nineteen ninety seven. The Orioles are supposed to, the Orioles are in the heat of a pennant race, which is hard for a lot of people who have become baseball fans in the last few years to conceive of, uh, but they're actually in the midst of a wire to wire, what would be a wire to wire first place run in, the, in 1997. They've got a game scheduled against the Seattle Mariners uh, on August 14th, 1997. And just before the game, there's a mysterious power outage. Some lights above the Orioles dugout go out and the game, there's a, two hour delay while they try to get the lights back on. Um, it's very confusing for folks who are there at the ballpark, many of whom we've spoken to because it looks more than bright enough to play. Um, but the game ends up getting postponed. And almost immediately, this rumor starts to go around that this is what allegedly took place. Ripken is on his way to the ballpark, realizes he's forgotten something hilariously in a lot of the tellings of the rumor, what he's forgotten is his glove, which does not seem like something Cal Ripken would forget. Um, <laughs> also doesn't seem like something that would be at home. It seems like yeah. something that would just be at his locker at all the time or on his hand, everything he does. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. He, <laughs> he's probably driving with the glove on. Um, but anyway, uh, whatever the alleged reason he turns around, he goes back home. He finds uh, his wife, Kelly and Kevin Costner, um, 
in amorous entwine, shall we say? And shall uh, we say the, it? Let's say it together, Stugatz. In <laughs> amorous twine. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, that was beautiful harmony. Thank you. Um, so he, at, the story goes, he and Costner allegedly get into some kind of physical altercation. Uh, Ripken is banged up, not catastrophically, but he realizes, I cannot play tonight. I can't play under these circumstances. So he calls the Orioles, allegedly says, you got to do something about this, maybe suggests the power outage thing, or maybe they come up with it on their own. Somebody, um, according to several tellings we've heard, takes, quote, a set of hedge clippers, cuts the power to the lights at Oriole Park. That's what makes the lights go out. That's why there were not outages anywhere else in the area. By the next day, he's fine. They play a doubleheader. Supposedly, nobody's the wiser. How That's much? The rumor. How oh, much? That rumor. How much time did you guys Checks spend out, investigating this? How many episodes are there? How thorough is the reporting? How close do you get to the truth? We uh, have been working on this for about a year. Um, we have spoken to tons of sources, many of whom had had never been uh, heard of us before. Uh, at the moment, it's either going to be five or six episodes, depending on a couple of uh, potential developments. And we, um, I, I will say, I, I, I'm not going to give anything away, but I do feel like we have we have reached uh, a, a pretty provocative answer about the, the truth of what happened that night. Did you get Costner or Ripken? I will. I will also say they have thus far declined our interview requests. We, of course. Uh, we have gone out to them through multiple avenues, also to Kelly, um, and it. we feel very strongly that it would not be the most complete story possible without their input. Uh, and so if they're watching slash listening, we'd, we'd love to talk. Um, but uh, we do have, there, there is some interesting backstory with the, with the rumor, particularly in Costner's case, which is that he at one point went on uh, Fox Sports Radio to do a very long interview about it with a couple of guys named uh, Chuck Booms and Kevin Kiley back in 2001. Um, spoke at length about the rumor. Um, in a very mysterious plot twist, we actually uh, tracked down the what is apparently the only existing recording of that conversation, uh, thought we had access to it, and then had that access revoked at the last minute. I'm not saying that was anything other than just what I've I've said, but it, it added to the soup of mystique that uh, exists around this. Well, what do you think happened there? You're not saying anything happened there, but what is your theory or what is your best, what is your juiciest accusation if we were speaking totally hypothetically? Speaking with complete hypothetical speculative energy, uh, I think it's probably a situation where one of two things happened. Um Mo less cynically, uh, it's it's probably just a simple situation where they realized it would probably piss off Kevin Costner to send it to us, um, and they didn't want to do that. Um, more cynically, you know, uh, it's a land grab in podcasting right now, and if you've got juicy audio that you didn't even realize you had until a couple podcasters came along asking for something that's been gathering dust in a CD jewel case for 25 years... Um, maybe you think to yourself, wait a minute, we should do something with this. Uh, hypothetically, again, speaking hypothetically, uh, I would imagine it's one of those two things, um, but perhaps uh, it contains even even hotter gas than we imagine it might. I don't know. Which one of the two do you like, Dan? Well, I thought it was going to be you getting in here and saying, I, when I realized, <laughs> this is when I realized I was getting to the bottom of something close on this story, when I realized other people were on the trail because I thought it was going to be you who ended up getting that sound because of the valuable podcast terrain that there is. It's for sale, Sam. And what would you tell us, <laughs> ah. what was in that conversation, Sam, for the people who do not know? Well, so one of the interesting things about this is because we did not get access to that tape, um, we, we've heard that we have one clip uh, that was played of it on Hannity and Combs because after the interview aired, uh, th this is the type of territory you get into when you start investigating a story like this. So after the Costner interview aired, it became a bit of a, a story and Hannity and Combs, Sean Hannity and Alan Combs, had... Chuck Booms, one of the hosts of the Fox Sports radio show on their TV show, 
to talk to them about it. Like, what, what just happened? You repeated this rumor, and then all of a sudden you've got Kevin Costner on the phone for over an hour? What is this? Um, and so as part of that, they played one of the clips from the Costner interview, and we were able to license that one clip through uh, the old Fox News archives. But that's actually the only one that we've heard. Now, according to Chuck Booms, uh, the interview was very damaging for Costner because he called in to say, I've never even been to their house. There's no truth to any of this. But when they started to ask him a bunch of very basic sort of factual questions, like if you, do, if you sp supposedly don't know them very well, why have you been photographed at all these games with them? Why do you sometimes take ground balls at shortstop with Cal before Orioles games? Um, where were you on the night of August 14th, 1997? You're a figure of some note. Presumably there would be a record of this. He, again, all this is according to Chuck's recollection of the conversation, did not have answers for those questions. So it's one of those situations where um, Costner or maybe Costner's people, I guess, get it in their mind that they should try to get out in front of this and end up fanning the flames instead. Where are some of the places that the reporting took you that you found most interesting, illuminating, different, and allowed you to tell a more macro story? Because I'm assuming that you go into a project like this for a year. It's not just to get to the bottom of a silly rumor. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, as I've already referenced, we talked to Chuck Booms, who, uh, in addition to being a key part of the story, was just sort of an interesting figure uh, in sort of the types of sports talk radio that were very popular at the time. And he told us all kinds of interesting stories about what it was like to, um, to talk about sports in an environment where it was harder to fact check things uh, than it is now. Um, and I, I assume things. that they could be irresponsible in what it is that they were doing. And the only thing that gives it legs is Costner calling in. Otherwise they can't actually talk about it in a, that Costner helped keep the story alive by trying it to, it was the glory days, trying to yeah. deny it. Yes. <laughs> Stugatz loved those days when you could just say whatever you wanted and there was no social media consequence. Yeah. If only, if only we could, we could go back to those days. Um, so, so that was pretty fascinating. Uh, we end up going to um, the, one of the things we do in the show is we look up police reports from uh, the, that we looked at a month, basically, the, the night of the outage and a month leading up to it to see if any, the police were summoned to what was then the Ripken property at that time. Um, and we end up then going to visit the property and you know, one of the things that was interesting for Mac and I to discover as lifelong Cal Ripken fans is that this guy who was by repute the blue collar superhero of the world lived in what was recently listed on Zillow as having um, uh, 13 bathrooms and two four car garages. It's so big you can't even see the house from the road. Now, obviously a guy having a big house does not prove that anything untoward happened, but it it is one of those important moments as a fan in realizing that there's the story that's built for you to consume, and then there's the reality of, of the life somebody lives. Um, more In a more concrete sense, uh, we ended up actually getting a guided tour of the entire electrical system of Oriole Park at Camden Yards, including, um, and this comes out a little bit later in the series, but uh, we, we actually end up seeing the control panel that would have been used to initiate this fake power outage. Um, if that is indeed what allegedly transpired. Um, and that was pretty powerful for me from both an investigative standpoint, but also from a, a personal standpoint, because the, that control panel is in the back of the press box. And I used to sit at Orioles games with my dad in section 43 at Oriole Park, which is just to the left of the press box. And I would stare, as much as I was watching the game, I wanted to be one of the guys in the press box. Uh, and so it was pretty powerful to me, this idea that um, this alleged incident would have been initiated in the room, like literally where the stories are made, uh, leading of course, to this story that we are now investigating. So it was a, it was a moment for me of realizing like I have moved to the other side of the veil uh, but at what cost? <laughs> well, what were you trying to do, right? Because you guys are going on a journey and it's uh, five or six installments. It'll come out every Monday. And part of it is getting to the truth. But with these kinds of dedications, when you 
turn your life over to a project like this. You're trying to accomplish what? I mean, you're following the story, but what is the story that you were thinking about telling and how was it different or not different than the one you tell? Yeah. I mean, I think a big a big thing for both of us is this idea that um, for, for us growing up as fans and I think for a lot of people, particularly, not that sports are only for, you know, cis hetero men, but as cis hetero men, sports and the Orioles in particular were kind of the way that we could access feelings. And it's what gave us to talk about and express these big overwhelming ideas that would otherwise have consumed us uh, and, and some, sometimes did probably consume us. And the, not just the team, but the person, the, the figure at the center of that was Cal Ripken Jr. He was the closest thing in my life that has ever existed to a God embodied on this earth. And I have realized as I've gotten older in my life, you know, and I, my thought with myself was, I love this man. I, I love this man. And what I realized um, in the course of doing this project is I needed him. And need is different than love. And I would like to move away from, from need in my life and into a place of love. And I think it's been a very powerful process to realize if we don't need a particular mythology to buoy us and, and propagate us forward through our lives anymore, how can we move out of that into a, something more all-encompassing, which is love? And in order to do that, you have to look at something um, in a much more holistic and, and human way. Um, and that's really, I think, what the project is about. You won't tell us if the rumor is true, right? I, I'm, I, I have can't. to, I have to ask you, but you won't tell us because you need the payoff in it. installments, correct? I, that is that is an accurate diagnosis of, of my plan for this interview, yes. <laughs> you can ask but, me, Dan, if you want. I mean, okay, yes. I, it sounds like Stugatz knows. Yeah, and yeah. I have the interview. I mean, the whole uh, okay, thing. you have the Kylie yeah. and Booms yeah. interview that yeah. you secured. Uh, Stugatz, what's your Venmo? I'll, I'll send you the money right now. <laughs> I mean, now you're talking my language. I take Sal as well, Sam. All right. I mean, <laughs> uh, what do you think happened? Because Stugatz always wants to believe in the war, the worst in people. And so I want to believe that the streak was kept alive the, uh, that because yes, Kevin Costner. It's funny that you're putting that on Stugatz while you're confirming that belief yourself. Yes. If I had to guess here, Cal Ripken just had a gut feeling about something was going on with his wife <laughs> okay. back in the house, and he didn't turn around to get a uh, mitt. Okay, he went he to, 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 was, to get revenge. Well, to, yeah, get, to see if, to get if justice. What it, yes. To see, you know, if hell what bent, he was feeling was true. Yes, hell you know? bent on justice. He right. returned home like John Wick to kick the holy hell out of a traitorous. <laughs> Kevin Costner. Yes, I believe that that's what's And true. my investigation has not totally absolved Dennis Quaid. I will tell you that right now. Okay? <laughs> oh, Dennis man. Quaid. Sounds like, it sounds like we need a seventh episode. Uh, uh, Ran <laughs> Randy Quaid has been absolved. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he yes. would not be allowed anywhere on the Ripken property. Dennis yes, Quaid. Yes. Yes, half the Quaid, half the Quaid clan is 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 removed from blame. Although I have to say, you know, just since we're talking about this part of it, something that is very interesting that a lot of people who just hear the rumor don't totally clock at first is by the time this happened in 1997, Cal had already broken Gehrig's record. He was he was well past it. In fact, uh, it was 1995, September 6, 1995, uh, against the California, the then California Angels, that he broke the record, a game that I was at, um, and which was a night of a total emotional transcendence for me. Um, but it raises this really interesting question, I think, because, you know, if you're an Orioles fan, the idea that ego or uh, a sense of, of you know, um, personal ambition would have had anything to do with Cal's pursuit of this consecutive game streak didn't even enter your head. But there were people from outside Baltimore who thought to themselves, you know, like he's lost a step at shortstop. They've moved him to third base. He's not really hitting the way he once did. He's already broken the record. Why is he still going out there every day? Like, what's the point of this? And if you're from Baltimore, you're like, well, it's because it's the right way to do things. And if you don't understand that, you know, uh, then, then, then you, sir, are not a man. Um, where, but doing a project like this with the benefit of hindsight, you know, you're, you're forced to actually contend with the idea like, well, what, what do we think this was really about? And, and isn't it sort of interesting to, that he's aligned with Kevin Costner in this regard, who was sort of, as one writer puts it in the show, 
people thought of and perhaps still think of Kevin Costner as this kind of walking Americana figure, this guy who represents that sort of like honorable working man who has been through a lot and yet still persists. Um, and that's what Ripken represented for a lot of people too. But, you know, Kevin Costner is this rich celebrity guy who has not uh, put in the kind of blue collar hours that um, a lot of the folks who he's, whose uh, image he's sort of performing in have. Um, and so what do we make of the gap between those things, especially when the actual people who had to diagnose and resolve this power outage were those guys and nobody's ever talked to them about what it was like to work behind the scenes at a baseball game. Nobody's ever, you know, asked them, was this hard? Did you have to deal with people asking you a bunch of insane questions, you know, when you're, you know, sweating your balls off at the top of a light standard uh, in the late August, in the, you know, middle of August trying to fix this thing. Um, and so it, it, it brings up all these, these other questions that I think are, are much more relevant than uh, the truth, which, again, I, I, I do think we've, we found a pretty provocative answer to. Sam, I'm not gonna, annoyingly vague. <laughs> right. I'm not going to tell you how to do your job, okay? Uh, you're clearly excellent at your job. I would just tell you, Sam, you might want to sniff around Kevin Bacon. I mean, <laughs> the little sniff, okay? Yes. Uh, while you're getting to all your hoity-toity ideas about love and you realize that your fandom is a lie and your heroes are liars and cheat, Sniff around Kevin Bacon, okay? <laughs> okay. Or David Caruso. Uh, okay. uh, you you got to be careful with Caruso. <laughs> Let's. Can we toss Tom Berenger in there while we're doing this? Why not? Steaming, yep, yep. steaming Lothario Tom Berenger <laughs> yeah. making his someone, way over to the Ripken someone house. Someone to watch over who, Tom? <laughs> Rut Rutger Hauer was knocking on the door. Corbin yeah. Birdson. <laughs> Let's get them all in there. <laughs> Wait, Sam, if this is true. If indeed it's true, because you clearly uh, care about it, right? Should the streak be intact? Should we get rid of it? Oh, it's really? Over. An asterisk? You want an asterisk? Should we put yes. an asterisk? I'll on the so sports, sports radio. I, I hate no, you. No, Sam no, I, no. Let's, Sam just, no let's just put Kevin Costner's ass <laughs> yeah. on it. It's not asterisk. an asterisk. I'm not going to count it, Sam. It's an ass trick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's leave off the tourist and, and really cut to what America wants to see. Sam, thank um, you for being on oh, with us. Oh, he wants to answer. Go ahead. He's going to give away the entire podcast series to you. Go ahead. He wants to answer. Go ahead. Well, I would, I would, in response to that, just say that, you know, as regardless of, of where our story goes, I do think it's, it, it is important to remember that Cal had already broken the record by the time this incident allegedly occurred. Um, whether or not we should, we should reconsider why we're so attached to what we think the streak means that I will leave uh, maddeningly open-ended. Well, I heard Wesley Snipes, too, just so that we can have some wow. diversity here. I heard we Wesley Snipes. We were very Snipes. clearly going for a certain <laughs> thing. Um, yeah. I just call got a text Luke on Diamond Jim Phillips Carey might have in. been there as well. You were getting ready to tackle this as well. Huh? I, I mean, and while we're Benjamin at it, Bratt. I don't know that Ellen wasn't there as well. All right, we'll see you later. Thank you, Sam. We'll talk to you. Thank you, guys. Much appreciated. See you, Sam. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Cheers. Send my Thanks, apologies guys. to Mac. I'm sorry about that miscommunication. No, no, no worries at all. I texted him. It's we're all good, and I Great. really appreciate the opportunity to to talk to you guys. I'm a huge fan of the show, and we really appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you, man. You. Appreciate it. Take care. Cheers. Take it easy.